I'm Dr. Rick Green from the medical school class of 1970 and again it's my pleasure to host this program which really highlights our outstanding emeritus faculty uh, at the University of Virginia School of Medicine and today I'm absolutely delighted to be talking to someone who's a little different than the usual person that we talk to, uh, Dr. Carolyn uh, Engelhard, uh, who's the uh, previous director of the Health Policy Program, Associate Professor of Health Policy, and recently a retired from the medical school. Carolyn, welcome. Thank you, Rick. So, I am so excited to talk to you because when I was a medical student here, we never heard the term health policy. We never had any instruction in health policy. You're at the medical school. You've obviously interacted with medical students. Mm -hmm. Tell me what exactly you did or still do with the medical students to try to engage them in, in, in the area that you're interested in. Thank you. I feel so blessed to be on the cutting edge of pedagogy at the University of Virginia School of Medicine introducing medical students to health policy. I mean, they graduate after four years and they know a lot of pathophysiology and they have very little idea about the environment they're going to be working in. So about 10 years ago, we started a program called DXRX, which took all 160 medical students after their third year, their clerkship year, it was their first time they came together after their clerkship year, and for eight days we did a health policy immersion. Everything from medical malpractice to how you measure quality of care to what subspecialty you want to pick, how doctors are paid, is medicine a business, as well as healthcare reform, big picture. What should we be thinking about politically, policy-wise, and how can physicians be change agents? amazingly successful. From that I kicked off a fourth year elective that was voluntary for medical students and every year I get between 30 and 40 fourth year students taking the elective, a month long elective, and they would come to my class. I teach a graduate seminar in health policy both semesters. They would come to my class during the month they were with me and then we'd have a pull out journal club and they would pick journal articles. So for instance, if they were going into surgery, they might pick, uh, well, one aspiring young surgeon chose an article for Journal Club on that sort of controversial issue of surgery, two surgery, concurrent surgery. Certainly. And she presented that to the group, we discussed it, and then she would write a 10-page paper for me doing a deeper dive, looking at primary references and really looking at that topic. So I did that for multiple years and then there's a program for first year students called Social Issues in Medicine that Dr. Modenad Carney spearheads and that puts first year medical students in the community with different nonprofit groups like the Free Clinic or JABA, Jefferson Area Board for the Aging or the Homeless Shelter and they had they asked me to do two lectures in that series on healthcare reform and then once the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare came forward it was really mostly an update on the ACA and who was insured and who didn't have insurance and why and what were the cost problems and what were the politics and then when President Trump was elected it got even more exciting. So if a student really got so excited that they wanted to do more in this area, maybe get another degree. How, how, how would they do that? Well, in my department, Public Health Sciences, medical students have the opportunity to do an, a master's in public health. And when you do an MPH, wherever you do it, if you're in an accredited program, you have to have competency in five subject areas. Mm -hmm. And one of the subject areas is health policy and management. So if a medical student wanted more, they could come back and take an extra year and get their MPH and then do their, we call it their final project with me uh, or at the free clinic or something like that. You know, really struggling, looking, doing some data analysis, looking at a health policy issue. Now you're involved with the Batten School. I am. I'm so an adjunct did, professor How there. does that interact with our medical school at present? I mean, I know you're yeah. sort of a... Uh, bring the two together, but do the students do anything about it? Our students do not. 
Batten has a very small health policy presence. They're much bigger in American government, foreign relations, um, and so I have Batten students take my seminar. And there was a Center for Health Policy that was a joint project between Batten and the, and the School of Medicine. And that was started by actually Tim Garson. I don't know if you know oh, Tim. Sure. Of course. He was Prior a former dean, dean and mm -hmm. then provost. Tim and I actually co wrote a book together. Yes, I'm very aware of your book. Yes. I didn't realize that you were the co author with yes. Tim. And I've read your book, oh. and Tim gave me a copy of your book. So oh, thank good. You. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Tim and I were sort of connected at the hip for several right. years. So Tim started the Center for Health Policy, and then when he left to go to Texas Medical Center, it was taken on by a wonderful Batten professor named Eric Potashnik, who started one of the deans of the Batten School when it was begun. Eric was recruited away by Brown, much to our, all, all of our sadness, and then Dr. Mike Williams, who's actually a general surgeon, uh, took over as director. And it's fledgling. I still, it's, you know, centers have the an enviable role of being either a department or a school. So you're, the people in the center all have homes other places. But we collaborate and we have some students who come and work uh, there um, and you know we're hoping it will get more traction as we go forward. Well I, I, I have to ask you because we're um, in an election year and a lot of it's about health policy. Um, what would you advise, uh, you know briefly, what would you advise any of the candidates relative to universal coverage, anything right. like this? Sure. So. Mario Cuomo, former governor of New York, who is the father of the current governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, once said that campaigning was poetry and governing is prose. So what I would advise is to not get too deep in the weeds. People are desperate for um, some plan, some idealism, some passion, and yet Believe me, as someone who's been in health policy for 30 years, it takes a nanosecond for people's eyes to glaze over because mm. it's so complicated and everything's so interconnected. I would, uh, because I'm so pragmatic and because I know all the pieces so well, I would caution anyone to actually believe we could pass a Medicare for All plan that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren would like, mostly because there's not a prayer that they'll have 60 votes in the Senate. And you can have every good idea in the world, but if you can't get it through Congress, you're not going to have it. Not true. So I would also advise people to remember that in the 2018 midterm elections, the 40 seats the Democrats picked up that gave them the majority, once again, were in places uh, where moderate centrist candidates ran. So I think the silent voter that doesn't protest, that doesn't love Medicare for All, that isn't out there on the streets, that voter really wants something not so huge, wants to fix the system bit by bit, to build on what works. So I have to say that I kind of side, if, as a policy expert, I sort of side with former Vice President Biden simply because I think it is the most pragmatic and it aligns best with our political institutions. I mean, we have to realize the founders created our government so that big change wouldn't happen because we were rebelling against a monarchy. So we have a fairly weak executive. It may not seem like it these days, but we have a fairly weak executive and we have a legislative branch and a judicial branch all meant to exert checks and balances on the other. So I think historically we would do best to learn that we do things best when we do them bit by bit. Incredibly uh, good advice. I can't let you go. 
uh, unless we talk a little about what you're doing since you've uh, yeah. left officially at right. the medical school. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, I, I, will always, I always tell my students at the first day of class, I start every class I have for 30 years with a quote. And uh, I tell my students that I'm the person that, you know, has the unfortunate scourge of not being able to turn off what's going on in the world. I'm a true political junkie, and I wish I could say that my four hours of tracking health policy every day has diminished. It has a little bit, but uh, I'm still keeping up. I currently serve on two boards. I was on the board of the Charlottesville Free Clinic for 13 years until the bylaws said I had to leave. But I served in, I was chair of the board, vice chair, secretary for many years. I left uh, the local free clinic board and I now sit on the state free clinic board. And while it's really exciting rubbing elbows with like the head of, of Anthem and um, some of the other big wigs in Richmond, I really, really miss the physicians and the patients from the local free clinic. I know you, uh, as a physician, medicine is really about that clinical encounter and that personal touch, and I miss that very much. But, but I, I appreciate where it, being able to serve in this capacity and talk to legislators and advise uh, the board on how I see policy moving. I also sit on another community board. Um, those two keep me relatively busy. I'm still teaching one day a week at UVA. I will, in the fall, I'm doing it with public health students, and in the spring, I'll be doing it with medical students. And in both cases, I'm handing off my babies to young faculty. Uh, so if, if I had any legacy, it would be that I groomed the next health policy experts to take over what I started and I particularly am thrilled that I'm handing over my medical school portion. I have many roles in the medical school but the elective is going to a wonderful young GI physician who was my student and I and we're, we're going to teach together in the spring and then he's going to go off and do it. Other than that I go to Hawaii four times a year to kiss my grandchildren and uh, spell my busy physician daughter and um, you know I I keep waiting to get bored but I'm not. Well it doesn't sound like you're going to slow down anytime soon. Right. I think we're very fortunate to have had you for these years at the medical school. We've been talking to Carolyn Engelhardt who was the head of the health policy program at the University of Virginia Associate Professor Carolyn, thank you so much for talking with us. You're welcome. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you so much for having me.